Okay, so these are completely different parts. It's a very practical uh, uh, set of uh, advice for um, writing uh, effective text. And uh, the idea is to keep it in mind for the exercise afterwards, okay? So, first of all, uh, what I said to her, I don't know your name, okay, uh, before, uh, that is, you learn to write by writing. So being a journalist is really a kind of a, a, work, um, a craftsmanship. You don't theoretically learn how to do a chair or to make a chair. You, you, you learn it by making chairs. And I think journalism, journalism is the same. This is why internships are very useful. In my opinion, they are more useful than, for example, journalism, journalism masters because they really give you the practical tools, okay? So before putting yourself at writing, and this I think is very important for the kind of thing that you write, is uh, try to uh, identify specifically what you want to talk about. It is very easy when you are uh, dealing with complex problems to ending up wanting to explain the more general, the broader perspective. But sometimes it's not a good strategy. You really need to talk of one subject at a time to convey a clear message, and then there will be other occasions to, other opportunities to talk about other issues. Then always before putting yourself at writing, uh, two important things are the following. First of all, how I will write the story, how I will build my narration. There are different strategies. One very easy one is the chronological one, that is, um, um, arrange your, the facts you want to tell in, the chron in a chronological sequence, but there are <laughs> other strategies that may be re very relevant for the kind of subjects you cover. For example, not following a chronological um, sequence, but a sequence of locations. So something more similar to a movie. First you explain what's happening in one place, then in another place, then in another place. Other possible strategies are a logic argumentation. So you don't follow the chronological evolution, but the logic relation between elements, or a simple list, OK? And then, always before writing, it is very important to identify the relevant context. That is, I want to explain this subject, this issue. What are the things that I have to bring in to explain it? What are the antecedents? What are the string of facts that bring to this fact. What are the events that will relate to this fact in the close future? Or for example, if you are, for the future, if you are talking about, let's say, something related to climate change and there will be a meeting on climate change in one month, it is very important to bring this into the article. What is the related research? And obviously, what is the framing, the possible ideological framing or political framing of the issue. Then, once you have this information in mind, a um, uh, paradigm that is used in uh, journalism to uh, order the information is the so-called inverted pyramid paradigm. If you're writing a scientific paper, usually you start with the background, and then you develop an argumentation that reaches the conclusions, the results, the original part of your work. In journalism, the perspective is completely the opposite. You start with the result. You start with the news themes. You start with the conclusions. You start with the message you want to give. And then, in the end, you go to the background. OK? This is a very practical way of uh, thinking when you want to uh, put the information in order in an article. So from the more interesting things, from the newer things, from the more attractive things to the less ones, OK? This could even be applied at a microscopic level. That is, if you have a set of things that you want to say, a practical way of ordering them is saying, which is the more attractive one? Which is the thing that? It's newer. Which is the real message that I want to give? I will say it first, OK? And then I will explain the background. OK, now I wanted to show you uh, 
short movie, a piece of movie that explains, that tells a lot about what uh, is the logic. It is taken from um, the front page, a very famous movie by Billy Wilder. I, ho I hope you will uh, you will hear it. I also heard it a second. So they are in the newsroom and they are discussing about an article. So this is the head of the newspaper. This is a journalist, and he is uh, asking him to read the beginning of his article. Okay. He's reading this, uh, the lead of the article, the beginning of the article, and he's saying, okay, um, there has been a shooting, these people have died, and the director says, and don't you mention the examiner, which is the newspaper that has discovered the story, and he said, wait, I will put it in the second paragraph, and the answer of the director is, who the hell is going to read the second paragraph, okay? So this is something that is interesting to keep in mind, really, who the hell is going to read the second paragraph? You may write a very long feature, but maybe people will read the title, the subheads, the, the head, uh, uh, the subheads, and that's all, and maybe the first part. okay? So, this is a practical and uh, cynical way of stating what I said before, really start with the important thing. So, this is an example of how uh, news or a press release may be, may be um, built. The <coughs> At the beginning of the text, it is really important to put what happens more. Uh, journalist Peter Corrigan has a way of uh, explaining it, which is the story of a friend on a hill. Imagine that you are running, you have very important news, you are running, and there is a friend on a hill, on top of a hill, and you have a very important thing to tell him or her. So you run, you get to the top of the hill, and you have enough voice only to say a sentence. That is the title. That sentence is the title, OK? Another way is the trailer. That is, another metaphor is the trailer. That is, this part of the article may be thought, should be thought, as a as the trailer of a movie that is telling really the more attractive things, the most attractive things, because you want to convince the person to go to and see the movie, or uh, out of the media, or you want to convince him or her to follow reading the article. So what are the things that matter? What are the important things? It depends a lot on what you are telling about, but something that Mm, certainly should be included in these initial parts of the article in, are the famous uh, 5W and 1H, that is what, who, when, where, why, and how. That is, you, you, you don't always need to answer to all these questions because sometimes the answer is trivial, it's obvious, it's not uh, relevant, but it's a good check one can mentally do when uh, uh, you write uh, the beginning of an article to check whether you have answered to all these questions. For example, if you are writing a press release on a publication, at a certain point of the beginning you have to explain who has published this, when it has been published, uh, where, etc. And another very important thing in this part is to make it uh, to, to avoid interrupting the flow of the, of the reading. That is, Thing that really readers don't have a lot of time. They, there are there is a lot of competing information. So putting here something that makes the reading difficult, it's not a very good strategy because it may be that the reader finds it difficult to interpret this first paragraph and decide to move to another one. Okay. So for example, in academic um, coverage, 
there is a big temptation to start saying the Institute of uh, Science and Technology and the Environment has published in this newspaper, in this, in this magazine, uh, publication authored by this, 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 and this person, uh, and then you say, what is the result? Bad strategy, because nobody's interested in this, it makes a lot of difficulty, so maybe you have to tell it, but don't start with this, okay? It is better to go to the spot. Then, once and if you have managed to get the person reading the second paragraph, which means that roughly it will be 10% of, of the people that has read the first one, um, an important thing is not to disappoint the reader. I mean, if you have created interest here, try to keep it here, okay? So if you have put here the most important thing, put here the second most important thing, or the second most, most attractive thing. For example, a strategy that sometimes is used, not much in news and press releases, but in features, is to put here, to start the second paragraph, or the second block, with a quotation, a quote, sorry. Uh, because usually if the quote is good, if it's attractive, it's a way of breaking the rhythm and um, stirring the attention of the reader. Then you have the rest of the text, which will be read probably by 10% of 10%, okay? How do you structure the text, the rest of the text? As I said before, it's very important to think in advance a strategy, a sequence, how you will tell your story. As a chronologic story, as a list of ideas, as a logic sequence of things, as a list of places, and uh, one thing that is uh, mm, forbidden is to mix things. Maybe you have a story or two or three different stories that develop para in parallel. It's better to explain each one separately in a different block than to explain them in parallel because this will create a lot of confusion. So, for example, if um, look here, if you have two different point of views on the same issue, it's better to put them close. Not to explain one point of view, then go to another issue, and then explain the second point of view. It's better to have them close so that the reader understands the differences. Um, other thing to be taken into account, uh, once you have given the main important information. Then you have introduced the quote and you have given the second important information, then maybe you can use the third paragraph or the third block to give some context, okay? To give some background. Another element that can happen are the so-called dead ends. That is, in your narration, you may have a side thing to explain that it's, uh, for example, a detail or something like this. If you have this kind of side things that uh, break the flow of the narration, it is better either to put them at the end or to put before a subhead. So you can break the flow with uh, these kind of little titles. In Spain, in Spanish, they are called ladillos that are mainly useful to, um, to, for these kind of things. That is, you, you make a deviation, then to the sub, hub, subhead, you go back to the story. And obviously, abrupt, uh, avoid an abrupt. Is the coffee ready? Okay. So what we have seen until now in this second part is the uh, uh, are you recording? Fine. Okay. Is the structure how to structure how to build the structure of the text, and then now I now I will give you some practical ideas on how to actually write. So we are going from a microscopic to a microscopic or microscopic um, vision. So. Some general ideas or uh, things to keep in mind when writing is uh, obviously the, the same idea I said before, that is readers usually don't have time. Don't have time, are not concentrated, maybe they are reading your article in a, an iPad or in a tablet or in a mobile, uh, in the tube. And, uh, and so it is really essential to be easy, to be clear, to go to the spot um, and uh, make 
polite and make reading uh, as easy as possible for your reader. This doesn't mean that you have to dumb down the issues. You can, uh, 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 an interesting rule of, the, rule of the thumb is to imagine that your reader is infinitely intelligent but infinitely ignorant. So uh, you don't need to dumb down the issues. You really can explain complex things, but you have to build it from the ground, from zero. Okay? Uh, and then a uh, key, I would say, ethical issue when you are doing journalism is accuracy. Uh, a good journalism, journalist is really something that is obsessed with details, obsessed with facts, obsessed with the, um, uh, the idea of giving exact data. If you give a number, if you give a name, if you give a figure, it must be a okay? Uh, how to obtain this? Basically, when you introduce a complex concept, a new idea, uh, the best way to introduce it, rather than giving the idea and then giving the example, is the other way around. Starting with a practical metaphor, with a practical example, with a practical anecdote that will convey the intuition and then go to the general concept. So for example, this is a sentence of Gaetalese, which explains what Liechtenstein is, and not being pleased on with the 15,000 citizens and 5,000 cows that is so tiny that his telephone book is just three pages. So he's giving a few practical data that tells you a lot about what Liechtenstein is. Um, using these four anecdotes examples is also a moment in which you can convey your point of view on the issue, your opinion, let's say, on the issue. Uh, um, so it's a it's not only a means for uh, making things more understandable, but it's also an, a, a tool for conveying meaning, okay? Um, and another important thing is when you introduce data uh, is to use comparisons. So for example, usually data on their own, their data are very difficult to understand, especially if you are, they are big numbers, but uh, they become much easier to understand if you compare with something. So, uh, 15,000 square meter buildings, it's equivalent to tennis, uh, five tennis pitches. A uh, 13,000 kilometer trip is the distance between London and Tokyo, and it's always useful, and it's uh, something that, when you get used to it, becomes automatic, is that when you give a number, you automatically give a term of comparison that humanizes the number, that gives the uh, dimension, real dimension, everyday dimension of the number. So, what are words and sentences that do work when we write this kind of text? First of all, short sentences. So, avoid subordinate clauses. If you have a sentence with many subordinates, it's better to split it with the full stops and make a series of short statements. Um, it will look like telegraphic communication, it's no problem. Uh, I mean, journalism is not literature. Journalism is conveying information, okay? Never use I and we unless in very specific occasions. Um, it is common when you are popularizing things to think about, to talk about our world, our country, our whatever, but if you say this, you are implicitly conveying the idea that the reader shares with you your social class, nation, group, or whatever, which is an assumption that it's not necessarily proof. Obviously, in very specific kind of features, it is uh, allowed to use the I to tell the story in first person, but it's really an exception. Adjectives are another critical thing. Um, it's better to um, use them only if they are really useful to, um, or they, if they are essential, if they are really essential to convey an idea. And in general, things like a lot, a few, big, small, are um, really uh, not relevant for an article. It's much better to give a number and use a comparison. So 13,000 uh, 13, kilometer trip, it's not a long trip. It's a trip as long as a trip from London to Tokyo, which is much better, okay? Much more comprehensible. Um, present tense and, uh, <coughs> sorry, past tense uh, and complicated tenses or passive 
should be avoided because they make uh, reading difficult, uh, and also impersonal, impersonal expression. Uh, because really, when you say it is so, people think and people say uh, no. I mean, who thought, who thinks, who says, who and has announced something? Okay. Quotes are very interesting because they give another opportunity to convey interpretation, to convey meaning, to convey context uh, about what you are explaining. While if you're writing news, usually you don't use um, a language that conveys opinion, co-quotes uh, mm, can uh, help to provide this context, provide this interpretation. However, not any quote, not whatever quote is useful. For example, if a quote is trivial, if it's obvious, if it's long, if it's uh, boring, it's much better to avoid it. Uh, on the contrary, usually quotes are interesting if they express a concept, an idea, in an original way, in a non-trivial way, in a way that changes things, changes the vision of things. If you're writing features, Quotes are essential, I mean, uh, it's a key piece of feature, but if you're writing more informative pieces like news or press releases, you should only stick to the real essential ones. Um, another thing that I mentioned already before of, the, of quotes is that they are useful to um, uh, improve the flow of an article. So for example, if you have a long, um, paragraph, for example, with many men packed with concept, sometimes it is useful to break it with a quote because it um, avoids the attention of the reader to fall down through the reading of the paragraph. And then, very practical thing, usually when you write a quote, after that you say, you write, says, Vitalia Catanzaro, uh, and if you have many quotes, it can happen that you have a, an article riddled with the says, 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 says. So it's better to use synonyms, synonyms like claims, declares, maintains, replies, states, suggests. Then there are sentences or words that don't work, that it's better to avoid. So first of all, technical jargon. Um, in, the article, in one of the articles that we will work on, there are um, uh, there are uh, um, expression like subjectification or uh, <laughs> things like this that, I mean, uh, if you write it in a, an article for the general public, it will kill your reader, I mean, instantly. <laughs> so, either you rephrase it, okay? So either... <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's okay, in, uh, it's okay in the paper, but really, either you rephrase it, or if you really think it is important, which it can be, I mean, depending on the objective, it can be of your article, it can be really important that your reader learns that subjectification is an important thing that matters for understanding the issue, then you can use it, but you really need to explain it. It's uh, completely absurd to use an expression like this in, a, in, a, in an article without explaining it immediately, because it will uh, create a hole in the comprehension of the reader. Then, Generic expression like experts agree that, etc., etc., etc. No, what expert, when, what they agree. So, for example, in instead of writing experts agree that, it's better to write when the agency showed in a report that, etc. Then, obviously, rhetoric sentences or useless connections like it is well known that, one can easily see that, naturally not expert agree on this point, these kind of things, better to avoid them. Uh, people will understand the connection even if you don't write a sentence like this. If you say an opinion in a paragraph and then you say that other experts uh, have another opinion, it's not necessary to explicitly state, and now I will tell you the other opinion. Euphemisms as well are um, complete bullshit. So, for example, the company is experiencing challenges in its positioning and will carry on a rationalization. No, the company is losing money because people don't uh, don't buy its products and will fire a certain number of employees. And if you put the number, it's better than saying that it will fire. Yeah. 
<laughs> and then obviously there are um, tedious expressions that journalists use, like you know when an accident is described as a battlefield, or things like automatic couplings of words, like alarming report or brutal murder. I mean, uh, every murder is brutal, obviously. <laughs> and uh, if you are talking about a report, it is likely that it is alarming. Or a useless adjectives like serious danger. I mean, if it's a danger, it's a danger. It's, that's it. And also, also this is uh, something that I hate, especially are trending words, words that s suddenly become become um, trendy and everybody uses, which is uh, especially in the, the Italian press, is something that is especially <laughs> makes me drives me crazy. <laughs> Okay, so now we are almost to the end. Just a few suggestions uh, that relate only to one part. I mean, some of you would be interested in writing themselves, but in the case you have to face journalists, to speak to journalists, this is some messages that as a journalist I would like to give you. First of all, I mean, there are bad professionals, but I can say that most of the times if you become a journalist, especially in this time in which uh, it is so difficult to make a living out of it, usually it's because you, have, you, you want to do your job well. So, um, if a journalist comes to you, it would be very interesting, I mean, it would be very important on our side to help them to do their job, uh, to commit with, their, uh, with, uh, with helping them, uh, because this will help yourself. Um, one very important thing is time. An experience that I have with uh, certain um, researchers is that I write an email on Monday saying, okay, I want to ask you about this, and then I receive an answer on Friday saying, okay, now we can talk, when the article has been published three days before. Mm -hmm. So it's better to acknowledge immediately that you have received the contact, and uh, um, either you answer immediately, or at least you ask the journalist what is his or her deadline, and you agree and respect it. You agree on the deadline and respect the deadline for your answers. An important thing is try to think in advance what is the mindset of the journalist and um, what are the kind of things that he or she will be looking for. So if you want to convey a message, mm, rephrase it in the ways or frame it in the formats that journalists will like. So they will like stories. They will like conflicts, they will like figures, they will like anecdotes, curiosities. So if you want to talk about your research, it is interesting even to take notes about these kind of things that you can use, let's say, rhetorically to attract the attention of the journalist and to help him or her to write his story. Creativity is very useful. If you don't have, for example, a specific example Maybe you can use a metaphor that will uh, convey the idea of what subjectification, let's say, is without uh, making it clear, okay? Um, honesty and uh, try avoiding to oversell your research is uh, always useful because um, it's better to say if you don't uh, know the answer to a question to say I don't know than to make up an answer that in the end will come out to be false because really the best thing that you can give with a journalist is trust is that he or she thinks that you are a good source uh, and in the long run this will allow you to have even more access because once you become a good source it may even be that you pitch a story or that you suggest a story to the one important thing is the off-the-record thing. Mm. In certain cases, you may want to communicate to a journalist something that is really sensitive without uh, saying that, without uh, mm, making public that you are the source of this. This doesn't mean, even if the journalist says, okay, I will keep it off the record, this doesn't mean that he or she can rediscover this with another source, okay? So, um, obviously, if you agree that he or she will not quote you on this, it's okay, but this doesn't mean that the journalist can rediscover the thing with another source, that the fact is not told in the story. I know it's very clear. Um, then, 
uh, sometimes people do <coughs> something that is uh, horrible, ask you, okay, now I've given you the interview, give me a copy of your text before it's published. This is forbidden. I mean, everybody has interests, also scientists, also researchers have, have interests, and when they see their declarations in context, they may become scared and they may be um, they may retract what they have said. So uh, it is not ethical to do this. If you have said something, you uh, it is essential that it is quoted correctly, but you cannot change it afterwards. Okay. Um, and then what I said before, once you have established a relation with a journalist, the best thing that you can do for him or her is to become a source for him or her. That is, journalists sometimes don't have time to follow how a story evolves over time. So if you help him or her, if you call when something new happens, if you send a quick email, maybe nine out of 10 times uh, this will be useless and there will, not be, there will not be space for covering this, but one over 10 uh, may work. Okay? Uh, Yes, please. Um, no, uh, can you come back to the flag? Because I, I maybe please have some problem with uh, help them to find what they look for. Yeah. Uh, because I think it's uh, too mild toward journalists or too obliging. Uh, mm. um, because sometimes I think uh, as a researcher uh, we should uh, even train the journalist on the topic. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example because uh, I have been guiding some journalists in Campania mm -hmm. and uh, Every time it happened, uh, first we have to we had to have one hour in which I was trying to break all the stereotypes that as journalists yeah. they have on the issue, because the, these are the things that you know go around in the media these stereotypes about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was trying also, yeah, to help them but not to, to please them. Mm -hmm. Okay, like to challenge uh, them and in order so that they can write something more. Uh, uh, different from the, the topic of, yeah, yeah, yeah. yes on that topic uh, yeah. because I I, I I think it took my role as a researcher yeah definitely no no that is very wise from your point of view what I am saying is that in the end after this they will they have a finite number of tools they can use to tell the story okay so for example they will always want to have a human story to tell okay so it's okay. Uh, to um, um, criticize and uh, break the stereotypes and maybe um, give another interpretation of the stories they have already told. But it's even better if you can provide them with another story, yeah. another human story that conveys your message. Do you know what I mean? Yes. That is, the past death twins is okay, mm -hmm. criticizing is okay, but it's even better if you can provide them with a set of tools that uh, allows them to tell the story correctly because in the end they will look for these things either if you give them these things or not so it's better that you give them that you have I mean these uh, weapons ready to, to give them and you keep more control of this and you help them really I mean it's not a matter of manipulating journalists it's a matter of really helping them to tell the right stories and not maybe the stories that are you know stereotypical and that everybody looks at them. Okay. Yeah. This is what I meant. Okay. But I definitely think that um, <coughs> keeping your role as a scientist and being uh, strict on the rigorous um, concepts right. that you yeah. want to convey, that it is very useful. I mean, it's something like, yeah. Yeah, a question. No, about there was a <coughs> person behind, and then you. Sorry. Then, then I go to you. My question is about the copy of an article before it is published. Yeah. In, main, in several occasions in Turkey, it happened with us, with some projects or with the news about the, our uh, agroecological food consumption cooperative, uh, that if journalists cut your statements and then with the text they include, it can really become a totally another format and a, a, a totally other argument. So would you suggest any way uh, to negotiate it? Because it's very important how to formulate the sentences. In Okay, first of all, what you are, what is completely right is to ask to be quoted um, accurately. I mean, they, they, mm, they don't, mm, it's forbidden to modify a quote at least in a way that changes the meaning of the quote. I mean, if 
you take away a mistaken word or whatever, it's okay, but if you change the meaning of the word, so this is something that you, I mean, if the journalist doesn't do it, it's a mistake. And then, I mean, quoting accurately means also quoting in the context. That is, you cannot, if mm, you are saying a sentence um, with a certain intention, it cannot be that this sentence is uh, decontextualized and used to convey another intention. And sometimes journalists do this, and it's a bad thing, and uh, the matter is that probably it's not a good journalist, okay? But what I stress is that um, it is not that you are the owner, let's say, of the true version of the facts. The journalist may go to another um, source or another stakeholder which has a different vision and the article has to convey the different versions of the facts. So asking to have to read the article in advance it's like, you know, if I interview the politician and the politician told me, okay, I am involved in a corruption case, or, in, or say something that implies that he is involved in a corruption, or she is involved in a corruption case. Obviously, if I show the article to him or her before, he or she will say, hey, no, 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 I haven't said this, even if I have it and I have recorded it. So maybe one thing that um, it is good to ask, for example, is to have the interview recorded so that you um, can refer to something documented in case there is a, in case there is a, a problem. And then, I mean, the, the, the thing that I was saying that is trying to build trust and to build a relation with journalists is something useful also, because first of all, you understand what kind of journalist <coughs> you are, you are, uh, you are uh, dealing with. So for example, if you know that this person is not accurate, it's uh, ideologically biased, it's not a matter of not giving the interview, but maybe you can be very, um, uh, I mean, you can st give the minimal statements in such a way that you defend yourselves. Instead, if you build trust, if you build the relation, then you have enough um, feedback with the journalist to um, be sure that he or she understands what you want to say. I mean, it's, it's not easy. The fact is that we cannot, um, the, the fact that some journalists are not good professionals uh, cannot imply that we submit our publications to the sources. In the end, who signed, one very important thing is that who signs the, new, the, the article is the journalist. So even the quotes that are included in the articles are a report of the journalist, even legally, um, at least in Italy and I think in Spain, if there is a legal issue, it's the journalist who has to take the responsibility, not the source. Okay? So, that's it. Okay? So, uh, here are some books uh, that I've used that are behind the three presentations. So the, ah, sorry, sorry, you, you have a no, question. No, it's Ah, okay, fine. So the first one is an Italian book, but it is translated in Spanish, but I think it's not translated in English, so I'm sorry for that. And this is about, let's say, the first part of the presentation, that is how mm, the, mm, con the context of, uh, of journalists, how it works. Then this very beautiful book, uh, okay, I put it in Spanish, but it's the original one is in uh, English, it's the Universal Journalist, it's a very, nice manual for writing. I would definitely advise to read it uh, because it gives a lot, I mean, in a very expanded way, um, it gives advices, uh, advice about how to write that. Then there is this interesting book by Nick Davis, who is the head of the investigative uh, section of The Guardian, which again explains a lot about those biases that I explained at the beginning, flat earth news. The concept is that Maybe nowadays, if one would issue a press release saying that the Earth is flat, several <coughs> magazines would, uh, would publish it, or uh, also <laughs> newspapers would publish it because they have really a little time to double check. Then this is an interesting publication by the European Environmental Agency, Late Lessons from Early Warnings, which is a collection of cases, of case studies in which uh, the precautionary principle was used correctly or not. And then this is in Spanish, is a summary of the story of. Um, of uh, environmental journalism in Spain. 
Okay, so thanks. Let us go to the exercise if you don't have more questions. More questions? Um, more maybe questions? if you can spend some words on the difference between a, a newspaper article and blogs. Hmm. Like about the structure or, or, or the, the scope, let's say, or the public. Yeah. Well, I mean, originally blogs are not strictly journalism. Usually they are made by people voluntarily, they convey opinion, they don't imply necessarily an investigation before. It's uh, only from time to time, really rarely, a blog is a piece of investigative journalism, okay? So first of all, it's a difference in intention. Um, sometimes um, newspapers or, or outlets have set up blogs that are explicitly journalistic, but it's just a matter of format. I mean, there are newspaper articles published in a blog, okay? At the level of the style, I would say that uh, what blogs uh, allow is uh, much... It, it, uh, blogs are a good um, way of uh, placing yourself as a source. If you have a blog, uh, it's a nice way in which you become a source to the journalist. You, the journalist can see that you are expert in the field, okay? And at the level of style, I would say it's more, it's closer to an opinion article than to the to a, mm -hmm. a feature or. A, mm -hmm. or a yeah, actually, my question was also related to the fact that um, well, blogs are increasing, increasingly used by, let's say. Journalists on the ground, sometimes mm. let's say. Mm. So uh, not professional journalists, but like uh, activists or experts or you know students, because of course the internet is opening up the yeah. uh, well more communication tools, let's say, for spreading news, and also um, blogs are more immediate, right? More everybody can own a blog, so mm -hmm. you can publish mm -hmm. it right mm -hmm. away, so you don't need to go through all this. But they can be influential somehow. Yeah, yeah. So if you, so I mean, it's a, yeah, it's, it, it's a source of, or it's a, um, uh, it's a way of doing kind of journalism, maybe mm -hmm. another type of journalism, but a kind of journalism which um, I think, at least we in our field, we should pay mm -hmm. a lot of attention. Yeah, I mean, and again, I think it's a very what blogs and what the internet have uh, brought brought is uh, an expansion of the sources. So for example, if you are already expert in the field, expert not only as a scientist, maybe you're expert because you're an activist or because you are a victim of a situation and you have a lot of information, putting it on a blog is something that maybe before you couldn't do, you didn't have a platform, and you become a source. But making the step of doing a journalistic job is another thing because if you want to do a journalistic job, it means that you have to invest a lot of work in doing an investigation, you have to talk with many different sources, and these kind of things. So it's something that usually bloggers don't do simply because of the fact that they don't have time to do it, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, they don't have uh, money <laughs> to do it because mm -hmm. really to do this kind of job you need a lot of time, a lot of uh, um, resources to, to, to do an investigative job. Okay. So I, I would encourage people to do these kind of things, especially if they have a uh, control of uh, information that would otherwise be obscured. Okay. More questions? I just had, a, it's in response to this as well, is that I think I've had the experience writing for the blog that um, a magazine contacted me, the New Internationalists, mm -hmm. contacted me to write an article. So I think this can be something that's really useful article, for the right? blog is that it helps people, somebody that's a journalist that was an editor yeah, yeah, yeah. of the magazine and contact to say, can you write an article for us? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that is what I was saying. I mean, that it's a way of placing yourself as a sort of positioning yourself as somebody that knows it, knows a lot about it. So, I mean, it can even be that you break news sometimes, because you are the first one to give a, to give a news, but it's only really from time to time. I don't think it's the job of a blogger to be a journalist. It's another thing, is to convey more interpretation, mm -hmm. opinion, to bring to light information, okay? Okay, so the exercise is the following.